will you pray with me? This is another time, Marty, that we're going to pray and worship, right? We pray all, all throughout. Um, so let us, well, God, we pray um, as you are the word of God, Jesus, in, in blood and bone, may you come alive to be honored and glorified. You are our rock, our redeemer. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. So I'm not getting forgetful. I, I did um, use this text two weeks ago, and I hear that our beloved Sue, our former moderator of our presbytery, then used the same text again. It does go to show that the Word of God is alive and can be um, give us new things and new insights over and over again. Um, one time, um, someone asked me if John, my husband, who's a preacher preaching somewhere else right now, uh, prepared the same sermon, and that would never happen, right? Because John and I could never preach the same sermon. Um, but it's amazing to me how the Word of God just continues to bless us and strengthen us. Um, so at the park, we talk about being the body of Christ. This lovely image that says that we cannot be down on ourselves and say, I'm not beautiful like a hand, so I don't belong um, kick me out of the body, nor can we be so self-righteous that we get to say to somebody else, you're not a hand, so you don't belong. Um, but at the end of this text, as I was reading um, Dr. Kim Bailey's, um commentary on, on First Corinthians, I found this treatise on evangelism. He talks about how um, the covering and the modesty of the parts that are the most important, he takes to be the reproductive organs and how we need to reproduce ourselves to pass our spiritual DNA to the next generation. And he gave this beautiful um, evaluation of what evangelism looks like if we were to take the body of Christ imagery seriously. And i got to tell you, I put it aside for the, park, for the worship in the park. He said, I didn't, I didn't know all the people there. I didn't know my audience. I, I hate to say it, but I know you all. So I feel like I can, I can dig a little deeper. Um, but that, that beautiful essay that Bailey wrote about evangelism kept, um, maybe I'll say marinating. I was marinating in it the last two weeks. Right? We live in a microwave society where everything is fast and, and furious, but when we marinate something, it takes days for the food to be ready, right? So I just sat in this beautiful text for a Wilmington Mission Conference and heard more about mission and evangelism. So I just, I felt maybe we should evaluate, maybe we should look at this text again, which is lovely that Sue did it again. So we're just going to, we're going to be ready to face the world. Maybe we'll do it again for the next month and maybe we'll Right? Oh, that was his 
version of evangelism. And can I tell you, I stopped. And I turned, and I don't know what would have happened, but my dear friend said, you are not getting in a fight with a crazy person. And she dragged me away from this guy who was trying to share the good news of Jesus. But in one moment, made a judgment call on me and my eternal punishment because of seeing me on Broadway. And I think we have misused evangelism, or dare I say, people have misused us, misused it on us. And so it's become icky. There's this story that came out years ago about um, a man named Penn. He is a um, part of a magic act called Penn and Teller. Anybody heard of Penn and Teller? I got a couple not. Penn is an avowed atheist. But he told this story and he actually took to the internet and made a video of it. Someone at his show came forward and told him about the love of God in Jesus and asked if he could give him his scripture. And what was interesting, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall of that conversation because this avowed atheist had respect for this Christian who somehow did it in a way that he felt that he was honored and respected and that it was from a place of compassion. Compassion means to suffer with, not to talk down or have pity, but compassion, suffer with, and experience. I'd like to think that that planted seeds. He never proclaimed that he believed in Jesus, but he commented on this lovely interaction with the Christian. Because we're not called to harvest the the, the, the harvest. We're not called to do the watering. We're called to plant seeds. It's God that does the spirit that does the conversion, but we get to be a part of it in the ways that we plant seeds. Unfortunately, shortly after Penn put this video out, some well-meaning Christians misinterpreted it and were spouting all over the internet that Penn had become a Christian. And I can't help but wonder if those seeds were ripped up and one extremely positive interaction with a Christian was wiped away. So Bailey talks about evangelism in the context of vulnerable, mutual relationships. So I want you to think of a love relationship. It does not have to be a spouse. It could be your best friend. Friend, it could be a child or a parent. But you're in that relationship for the long haul. You don't manipulate or coerce that person. But when you have good news, they are your first or second phone call. That according to Bailey, in this idea of giving honor to the the parts of the body that we tend to keep covered and remain modest in our culture um, are to be used in a way that keeps in consistent with the ideas of our love relationships, our, our, um, our reproductive relationships, our, our relationships that don't allow us to manipulate or coerce but actually call us to sacrifice for one another. Interestingly enough, the very next chapter of 1 Corinthians is 13. And so I'm going to ask another audience participation question. Who used 1 Corinthians 13 in their wedding? Okay, anybody been to a wedding that had 1 Corinthians 13? I've been to a lot of them because a lot of people have. 1 Corinthians 13, the very next chapter is talking about how we love one another. And so what does evangelism look like? If we take seriously that it's supposed to be in the context of a compassionate, mutual relationship. Um, I was just uh, talking to a young man at the New Wilmington Mission Conference. And he was completely unchurched when he found his way into a church at 16. He actually tells the story that he was um, 
um, Hispanic background who spoke no Spanish and found his way into a Spanish-speaking church. I'm not sure why, but he felt drawn and kept coming back. And the youth pastor at this church, he said, spent seven years, seven years pouring into him before he was able to grasp the love of God. So this is not a bulldog. This is a time-consuming act of love that we are called to. And we do it not just because we think our church should go, grow, but because we believe that God is love. That God knows you by name, knows everything you've ever done, and loves you even still. And that is good news, and that changes the way we can live in this world. And I've got to tell you, when I have good news, I like to share it. When I got engaged, you guys were some of the first to know. When I was having babies, or when we had to send the newsletter out to tell what the gender of the babies, or when my kids have done something good, or when I just received this or that, I want to share it. But many of us are slower to share that Jesus loves us and loves others. And I don't know if it's because of people with bullhorns that have given us a bad reputation. Or we're afraid that it would spoil our own reputation. But we tend to make our faith private. Not personal. My faith is incredibly personal. My experience of God is different, I would imagine, than each one of you. But it is not private. Our dear Eileen opens his love quoting um, St. Francis of Assisi, who said, Go out and preach the gospel, and when necessary, use words. I uh, think about that often. I don't think it gives us an excuse to not use words. Jesus, the one who shows us in human flesh what God's love looks like, use words. So it doesn't give us the right to not use words. But I think that our actions speak louder than words. Is that fair to say? And I think that our actions, when they are actions of compassion and love and self-sacrifice, when they are actions of mutuality and love, dare I say love, does not keep a record of wrongs, does not revel when others grovel, Read thir uh, 1 Corinthians 13 later today. When, when we do it in actions that are actions of love, I wonder if that gives us a platform, the ability to share what God is up to in our lives and in the world that is not bullhorn Christianity, but authentic representation of this love that we have received that honors this image of the body of Christ that Paul shares with us and that Dr. Bailey so beautifully wrote about. I wonder, as I've thought about this, I wonder if there are moments when I have been brash like the guy in the bullhorn, assuming I had the corner on the truth and hurt people's feelings. I also have spent a lot of time thinking about those moments when I felt a nudge and I stayed silent. I think this is an incredibly important time for us as Christians. As I've watched in the last two weeks, Christians of various stripes and flavors condemning Christians of other stripes and flavors because they believe something different about scripture or about a certain um, hot button issue or dare I say a political party and we have gotten mean towards each other and our non-Christian 
people who are friends with us are watching. How do we plant seeds and not tear them up? How do we not be a bullhorn, but rather live into this calling from St. Eileen through St. Francis of Assisi, go out and preach the gospel, and when necessary, use those words.